Welcome back everyone. We've been talking about covalent bonding and what I would like to do now is to go over some example problems. What I would ask you to do is if any of this seems confusing and you haven't seen my previous material on how to do covalent bonding and the skills you'll need to know, the background skills for this, I would like you to take a look at a previous screencast. I'll put a link to that right now. If you don't want to do that, let's go ahead and take a look at some examples. So let's do this. Uh, fluorine is going to be our first example right here. Fluorine gas, that's F2. And what we can do is start by drawing the Lewis dot structures for fluorine. For fluorine gas, that is, which is F2. And so if we take a look at this, if we just assume to start out with, we've got single bonds all around, and that's sometimes going to work for us, sometimes it won't. And so in this case, it does work for us. This is Fluorine, these are three different ways of writing this fluorine molecule where you have two fluorine atoms bonded to each other. In any case, that is how you would write out F2 in three different sort of versions. One version with just Lewis dot structures right here. One version with a bond substituted in for these two shared electrons right here for your second example. And for your third example, this is just drawn with a bond with no other Lewis dot structures drawn around it. And so, yep, that's fluorine gas. And if, if you look at the steps for drawing covalent bonds that I've gone over in my previous screencast, you'll see that starting out with single bonds is a good idea, but you should also be aware of how many bonds these atoms need to become stable. Fluorine happens to only need one bond to be stable. So if you have two fluorine atoms right next to each other, it makes sense that they could make each other stable. Let's go ahead and take a look at oxygen next, oxygen gas, O2. Okay, and so if we draw out the Lewis dot structures for oxygen, we've got six valence electrons to work with, and if I assume a single bond, we're going to hit a roadblock in just a minute. Let me show you what that looks like. Okay, and so if you look here, we have accounted for all six of our electrons on the left oxygen atom, and we've accounted for all six electrons on the right oxygen atom. However, we haven't drawn a full valence shell around each of these atoms, and so this while a first attempt is going to be great, it's actually not going to be correct. That's not what's going to happen in nature. That is useful. Uh, we could start out with just single bonds and see what happens. Another strategy is to look at the periodic table. Notice that if oxygen was to become stable, it would be O2 minus. It would gain two electrons to become stable if we thought about it ionically. And so either way you go about this problem through trial and error by starting out with a single bond between the two oxygen atoms or by looking at the periodic table and noticing that oxygen, ionically speaking, would need to gain two electrons to become stable. And there's a similarity here. It could also then therefore become stable by forming two covalent bonds. And so what you could do here is you could look at this as a trial and error, as I've shown right here, assuming you have a single bond between these two oxygen atoms and then noticing it's not going to work out. Or you could look at the periodic table and notice that ionically speaking, if oxygen gained two electrons, it would become stable because it would have a filled octet like neon. On. And so in a similar way, it could also gain two bonds, two covalent bonds, and become stable. Well, you could ask, well, how do we form two covalent bonds when we only have two atoms there? And the answer is with a double bond. And so if you were to take a look at each oxygen atom and sort of use a sort of visual representation of what's going on. How many valence electrons are now around the left atom? And if you take a look at that, there are eight electrons here. One, this is going to get a little messy, but just to visualize what's going on. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight valence electrons counting for this oxygen atom on the right hand side. And we can look over here and we've got eight valence electrons on the right hand side or I may have mixed those up left hand side and right hand side you get the idea on the left hand side we've got eight valence electrons on the right hand side we've got eight valence electrons notice that these four electrons in the middle count for both sides that's what covalent bonding is all about is that the atoms involved will be sharing electrons for stability reasons another way to write this out would be similar to this or an even more abbreviated way would be simply like this. In any case, that's going to be your structure for O2. Let's go ahead and take a look at what N2 would look like. 
you could try N2 with trial and error. If we draw a single bond here, nitrogen has five valence electrons to work with. The other nitrogen atom will have these five electrons as well. And this simply isn't going to work because what's going to happen is nitrogen is not going to have eight valence electrons around it. So there are two strategies. One is just trial and error. You could try single bonds and then you could try double bonds and then you could try triple bonds if you need to go to triple bonds and so I could show that strategy first. The other way is with the periodic table and I'll mention that as well. So let's try the double bond version and see if that works. So if I commit two electrons from both sides then that would represent a double bond. So we've got five valence electrons here and we've got five valence electrons here. Still this is not going to work. So it's useful information to know that single bonds are not going to work here. Double bond is not going to work here. So what we're going to need possibly is a triple bond. Let's see if that works. I've got three electrons committed from the left nitrogen atom and I've got three electrons committed for bonding purposes from the right nitrogen atom and I've got two electrons left over as a lone pair. These actually should not be triangles. These should be written as dots. All right. In any case, if you look, this actually works. This is going to work and this, believe it or not, is most of what you and I breathe in. Most of what we breathe in is nitrogen gas and it's got this super strong triple bond and that means in nature it's very difficult to break these apart and our health is dependent on bacteria that is able to do that fancy trick of breaking apart a triple bond. If you don't want to try the trial and error method, you can also look at the periodic table and just tell yourself, all right, I've got two nitrogen atoms, and what's going to happen is I need a triple bond. How do I know that? Well, if I look, it's in that column where it would need three electrons to become stable. Actually, I should write it as three minus right here. It would need to gain three electrons to become stable if we were thinking ionically. If therefore we were thinking covalently, there's a similar sort of situation there where we would need a triple bond. And in nitrogen's case, that would mean we would have three electrons committed for each nitrogen atom, which would mean we would have two electrons left over and a lone pair, which is exactly what we came up with over here through trial and error. We just used the periodic table to speed up the process if we were looking over there. Okay, so let's do another quick example. Uh, what we're going to start out doing is asking ourselves what's the least electronegative atom when we're dealing with multiple atoms here. Hydrogen is going to be left to the end in general and uh, carbon is going to be the least ne electronegative and so that's going to go in the center. We're going to have chlorine over here, chlorine say over here, chlorine over here. I could have put that in a different order. It doesn't matter the order so much, meaning like hydrogen could have been on the right or above and so on. It's still going to be the same atom. And so the least electronegative atom is going to go in the center. That's one of the rules that I talked about earlier on. I'll go ahead and draw the four Lewis dot structures for carbon. And one other thing to keep in mind too is whenever you have a halogen or you have a hydrogen, those will be great as things to put on the end of these molecules as you draw larger and larger molecules and think about what's happening because they only need one bond to be stable. So hydrogen is going to be stable right there. It's got two valence electrons. It's only in the first period so that's going to be fine. And chlorine, each of these chlorine atoms is going to have seven valence electrons to work with and if you count that adds up to eight valence electrons in total around each of these chlorine atoms and so this is what it's going to look like if we're just drawing Lewis dot structures. If we go ahead and draw the atom itself, if we go ahead and draw the ball and stick model, so to speak, itself, then we're going to end up with something like this. And that's it. That's a stable example here of a stable molecule. Let's take a look at at least another example. Okay, and so if we look at HCN, it's a little tricky, but you should know by looking at the periodic table at this point that carbon is going to need four bonds to be stable. And if you have trouble with that, please take a look at my previous screencast to be able to know how I came up with that. Hydrogen really only needs one bond, and nitrogen is going to need three. Well, if nitrogen needs three bonds, carbon needs four bonds, and it certainly needs, it, it certainly needs to have one bond with hydrogen here. 
So we have to spend one of our four valence electrons of carbon over here with the hydrogen. That would mean I have three electrons left, valence electrons left for carbon, and nitrogen needs three bonds. So it actually makes sense to say we're going to make a triple bond here with nitrogen, and then it will have a lone pair left over. So that's how it would look as a Lewis dot structure, complete Lewis dot structure. If we use the ball and stick sort of model, you would have something like this. And that would be the stable structure of HCN. Let's take a look at another, one more example. Okay, and so if you look at the periodic table, hydrogen should be something on the ends. We're going to end up with oxygen here, oxygen here, and another hydrogen over here. And then we ask ourselves, well, how many bonds does oxygen need? Really, it only needs two bonds to become stable. In a similar way, we could say, ionically speaking, it would only need to gain two electrons to become stable. So there is an analogy here. Well, if we had two bonds, we could do that with a single bond here, both here and here for this, and that would add up to one, two bonds. And we could do the same thing over here. We could have a single bond here as well, and that would add up to one bond right here down below and another bond in between. So basically, if you just start drawing this, it's going to work itself out pretty easily. And so that's what the molecule is going to look like as a stable molecule. Let me go ahead and draw the ball and stick model. And if you want to simplify it even more, you could draw something like this. So in the interest of time, I think I'm going to stop it right here. But thank you for listening. I hope you've enjoyed it. hope you've learned something. If you liked it, please like on YouTube or subscribe as well. And thank you very much.